noticed, uh, like I have, that there's a lot of bipedal featherless animals walking around, and uh, they're kind of hard to love, by which I mean other human beings. Many of us have probably realized how difficult it is to live with other people and to love them, uh, but I think now is an especially trying and difficult time. Now, that doesn't mean that people are bad. That doesn't mean that we're bad. What it means is that we are fallen human beings. And so I just wanted to do a little bit of a video uh, talking about ways in which we can live with other people, love them, and flourish with them. Now, you might ask, what's my expertise? Well, uh, you may not know this, but I have lived with other people my whole life. Now, a lot of you can say that, but I think my situation is a little unique. I was the youngest of six kids, uh, but my family also took in uh, special needs foster children. And so uh, throughout my life, uh, we would have uh, different kids who would come and live with us and then move away. And then uh, eventually four of them were adopted, and they're my four little brothers. Uh, and so every year it was like, okay... Uh, who lives in our house? We had to take a census every year just to know. That's not true. I was just kidding. And so as I went on from uh, my own home into seminary, went to college seminary and then major seminary, of course, both, you know, institutions that I lived with, uh, you know, anywhere between 50 and 120 other guys uh, and then living in rectory. So uh, one of the most important things is that we remain connected to God. You know, one of the basic problems in human relationships is that we put expectations on others that really we should put on God. Right? So we expect an infinite amount of patience. We expect uh, infinite fulfillment. We expect them to understand us completely. And those are really uh, things that only God can and will do. And so if we're filled up with the love of God, it's going to put a lot less pressure on those around us. So as we go about our day, of course, we know we want to make sure we get that prayer time in. I always suggest first thing in the morning, spending at least a little bit of time with the Lord, kind of setting that clock so that it's right for the rest of the day. Because if it's off at the beginning, it's going to be off for the rest of the day. Uh, and that also pulls us out of ourselves. A um, few questions to ask ourselves is, uh, you know, how patient has God the Father been with me? And if he has been that patient with me and all of my imperfections and my lack of, of love and my lack of virtue, well, with his grace, of course, how patient can I be with other people? Because I am his child. How forgiving has Jesus been with me? I can think of my own sins. I can think of all the ways in which I've fallen short. Uh, yet he is constantly forgiving me. Uh, and if he's constantly forgiving me, well, then I can, with his grace, forgive other people. Uh, and what about the Holy Spirit? The grace and the peace of the Holy Spirit has sought to pour into my life. Now, of course, a lot of times I've turned away from that peace. I've tried to seek that peace in other ways. But uh, if the Holy Spirit has sought to give me that peace, how can I share that peace with others? And how can I uh, even maintain that peace underneath a lot of negative and difficult emotions? So uh, focusing on the persons of the Trinity, inviting Mary into all this. That's a great way to start. Now, uh, besides that, as a community... Uh, you know, in a certain sense, a lot of us are living like monks and nuns. You know, all of us are Benedictines at this point in a real way. And uh, that's okay. That's actually in some ways good. Um, they call the religious life the state of perfection for lots of different reasons. One uh, is because it allows those who are religious to focus on loving God and loving neighbor. And so uh, one thing that religious have realized over the past 2,000 years is that they need to have a routine, a routine of praying, of working of eating, of playing together. Uh, and so it's great to establish a routine. Now, what a routine does for us uh, psychologically is it helps give us some stability during unstable times. So if I can say, you know what, when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and then I'm going to see this person, and then I'm going to do this. Well, that helps create a, a good sense of stability and routine. I know it's difficult, and obviously we have to be flexible, can't be rigid, but it does help psychologically, spiritually. Along with that, um, you know, the word communio, uh, the word communion, it means to, to be together with. Uh, and so communion is a good thing. Uh, we are a communion of persons. The family is, the church is, the, the trinity is a communion of divine persons. Uh, yet in that communion, uh, we are both, uh, there's, there's a distinction of the persons, uh, but there's also a union. And so we have to really prayerfully and deliberately decide 
uh, when am I going to be separate from other people? When am I going to take my own space and my own time and be off to the side so I can, you know, work on my projects or I can spend time just by myself? Maybe I'm more of an introvert. Uh, and when am I going to do that? Not in a way that's isolating, you know, running away from encounters with other people, uh, but in a way that's very deliberate so that I can be me and I can be with the Lord and so that I can come back into that communion with others. And then when's that going to be that deliberate time to spend with other people, whether I'm watching a movie, playing a game, all those kind of things. With that too, I think it's really crucial for us to say, well, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at screens, maybe by necessity, maybe because there's nothing else to do. So what are other things I can do where I'm not looking at screens? What are some, you know, maybe working on a puzzle or a board game or, or just sitting and talking or playing some card games? So what are some non-screen activities I can do? Because I think that really will help us reduce our sense of anxiety and isolation. And it'll also help us live in the present moment, which is very important during these times. I think it's good too to decide, uh, you know, what are the, some projects I'm going to, I'm going to work on. You know, this is a great time, which everybody is giving everybody a lot of grace. You know, if you don't get certain things done, that's okay. And so you can think, well, what are some projects I've always wanted to do and I can work on them. And guess what? If I don't get them done, that's okay. I can give myself a lot of grace on that and just to keep myself busy. Now, um, inner conflict or, or, or talking with each other, um, and resolving conflict. There are two extremes we can go to. One is to be aggressive. Of course, that's pretty obvious what aggressive means. You know, it means being maybe loud or threatening or domineering or trying to control other people in overt ways. But the opposite of that is passive aggressive. And of course, we all know what passive aggressive is, but often we fall into it ourselves. And being passive aggressive is also trying to control or dominate other people. It's not accepting their freedom, but it's trying to do that through indirect ways. You know, maybe I give this look or, or I say this thing and I hope that they get what I'm saying and I hope that, that they acknowledge that I'm the victim here. Well, you know, what passive aggression does is it takes that uh, freedom or it seeks to take that freedom away from other people. And it also uh, makes it so that we are no longer responsible for our own feelings. Well, we have to kind of hold and own our own feelings as difficult as that can be. So what comes in the middle? Uh, what's that virtuous mean? Well, it's assertiveness. Assertiveness is very directly saying, this is what I feel, or this is what I've experienced, or this is where the problem is. Saying it in a loving way. You know, often in our culture of nice, uh, and sometimes we can, we can uh, read the fake gospel of nice, and we can think, well, we just have to be nice all the time, or we have to avoid hurting other people's feelings. Uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes loving people means saying things that risk hurting their feelings, we're going to, are going to keep our relationship intact. Uh, along with that, you know, if somebody does something or says something that bothers me or, or there's something that, that needs to be addressed, I really have to decide. I have to invite the Holy Spirit into that moment and I have to decide there's only two things that I can do that are actually going to be helpful for our relationship. One is with the grace of the Holy Spirit, I address it directly. You know, once again, in that assertive way, I say, this is what's going on. Uh, I'd like this to change in this way. Uh, but the other is I can accept it uh, lovingly and carry that cross with Jesus. Now, those are the only two things. The other options are all bad options. You know, I can passive aggressively kind of carry it around with me. I can hang on to it. I can, I can drink that poison of resentment. Uh, the Lord wants to free us from all that. And he gives us the power to, to overcome all of those things. And so it's really important. Now, I know it's difficult and sometimes it's a stretch, but those are really important things to, for us to be able to do. In those moments where we feel tension, uh, where we feel anger, uh, one thing I always tell kids when they come to confession, they say, you know, I hit my brother, I pulled my sister's hair or whatever. Or maybe not kids, maybe adults do that too. I don't really know. Uh, but when people do that, uh, I always say, you know, can you love somebody and be angry at them at the same time? And kids get this. Kids understand that, yes, that is possible. So I say, okay, well, uh, next time you feel that anger, uh, next time you feel that frustration, invite the Holy Spirit in and just say this simple prayer. Jesus, I'm angry, but help me to love. Uh, that's a beautiful prayer to say. It's a very honest prayer to say. And what happens is then we begin to discover what's underneath that anger. You know, it's kind of like that iceberg where underneath it, we realize, oh, maybe there's fear. Maybe there's anxiety. There's a lack of control. And that turns us back to our prayer, giving that over to the Lord, not always putting that on other people because they're weak, imperfect people just like us, and they're doing their best. 
So I hope some of these things help, and I look forward to delivering a few more things, and hopefully I'm going to get one in Spanish here pretty soon. Uh, and as always, know of my prayers for you, and thank you for your prayers for me.